Thank you, guys. Um, Sarah, I don't know how you sing so well through tears. <laughs> Good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Japheth, you're doing awesome. Good job. Good job. And Nick, always great. <laughs> um, being that it's Father's Day today, I wanted to um, at least start this sermon this morning, even if I don't mention fathers again, I apologize. But I wanted to start this morning with a few good dad jokes. Um, <laughs> why do fathers always take an extra pair of socks when they play golf? In case they have a hole in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love dad jokes. <laughs> All right, so I'll love them. Uh, my, my, wi- my wife says that I need to... Um, do lunges, lunges to stay in shape. That would be a big, big step forward. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> uh, why was the calendar afraid? Why was the calendar afraid? Because its days are numbered. I mean, come, that's a good one, guys. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, so I was posting. Uh, not, I was. I saw a post on Facebook this morning of another pastor asking. Uh, and, and actually, I had written this into my sermon even before uh, that this pastor mentioned this, but another pastor uh, asked um, for some good dad jokes to begin his sermon this morning, and I already had three in my, uh, written into my sermon for this morning. But then one of the pastors, uh, it, I think the first comment was, he said something like, uh, just keep the jokes out of the sermons, pastors. Just, just stick to preaching. Um, pastors aren't any good at telling jokes, and that's probably true anyway, but but his point was that humor shouldn't be a part of our church service. And I'm thinking, are you serious? Jesus taught through stories and, and irony and humor all the time. Just read the parables, man. And I'm thinking, maybe I'm not a great joke teller. And that, that's why we didn't have huge uproars of laughter this morning. Um, but I think God wants to be like a father to us. And he wants us to relate to him like a child relates to his father. And I, and I hope my, my kids love me like that and know that they can come to me and know that um, we can just joke around and be ourselves together. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure God likes or tells dad jokes, <laughs> but, but I do know that he's our father and he loves to welcome us and, uh, into his family by faith. And, and yet, so many people refuse to come to him, to see him as, as father in fact, many of his children refused to come to him, whether out of shame or pride. And yet God has a plan to overcome our shame and our pride through Jesus. Romans chapter 9 is where we're at. Romans chapter 9, getting back into our series through Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 30, says this, What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes through faith, comes from faith. But Israel, uh, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, that is, but as if it was by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over, and the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Let's pray. Father, we are often ashamed. We're ashamed of our sin. We're ashamed of our past. And yet, in our pride, we often think that we can absolve ourselves of this shame through good deeds. Help us to see Jesus as our righteousness and believe on him alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we're all familiar with beauty contests, but in one, uh, when, in one particular contest... Some of the crowd uh, complained that the winner was not ugly enough. Um, This was the winner of that one. Um, (laughs) This is Mycin Sierre, the the 
winner of the Mr. Ugly contest in Zimbabwe in 2015. 36 people entered of their own volition, so they weren't, uh, they weren't just declaring random people ugly. They, they entered the contest themselves of their own volition into the Mr. Ugly contest that year, and my sincere was the winner. Um, apparently, the runner-up of the Mr. Ugly contest, who won for the previous three years, I don't have a picture of him, um, he claimed that my sincere was too handsome to win and, and said that his ugliness wasn't natural ugliness since it, wasn't, since it was based on his missing teeth primarily. Um, Mas Vinu, the, the previous winner, stated, but I am naturally ugly. He is not. He is ugly only when he opens his mouth. <laughs> now, I think my sincere isn't as ugly as he or the judges think because I think that there's beauty in everyone that God creates. Uh, and yet I share this, influ uh, this illustration because when we hear stories like this, we, we might think it's kind of weird for them to be boasting about their ugliness. And yet, that's exactly what our culture does. Or, or really, any of us does. When we take pride in things like our possessions, our knowledge, our sexual immorality, alcoholism, or, or even false humility. We boast and brag about these things that really ought to cause us shame. And yet we do things like this because, according to the Bible, we are all ugly by nature. We're born in sin. As David wrote in Psalm 51, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, 5. And this is the reality for all of us. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, verse 30 in our passage this morning once again begins with the phrase, What should we say then? We've seen this several times in Romans. Romans, if you just read it straight through, is one argument, and he just keeps on going. What should we say then? Just prior to this, Paul had just written about uh, objects of wrath and objects of mercy, and he made the point that even many of the Jews, God's chosen people, his children, who looked to him as their father, had shown themselves to currently be objects of wrath because of their faithlessness. And we've all been unfaithful. We've been there. None of us have perfectly obeyed God's commands. We were all objects of wrath. But this was all according to God's plan. So that even the Gentiles, that's, that's us, who are not God's chosen people, not God's children who looked to God as Father, even us could also be made righteous through Jesus. Continue reading verse 30. Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. I think us religious people often forget this. I mean, we know all the theology about grace versus works and we, how we're saved by, by God's grace alone. But in practice, we forget that righteousness doesn't come through what we do, but through what God has done. Now, many of you are probably thinking, no, I've, I haven't forgotten that, Pastor Chris. I, I, I know, I know. I know I'm saved by grace, and I know that my righteousness comes by grace as well. I know um, that it's all through Jesus. Awesome. Awesome. So let me ask you this. What if someone comes in and makes the same confession that they believe in, in God's grace alone for salvation, but they're convicted or even just accused of crimes in their not-so-distant past that you don't even want to think about. Will you accept them as a brother or a sister in Christ? And maybe you would do that much. Maybe you would accept them as a brother or sister in Christ, but, but would you think or even say, well, I, would, I would never do that. Speaking of the thing that they were accused of, I would never do that. And in doing so, subtly think that you're better than them. In other words, maybe you think you're saved by grace, but made righteous through works. 
Maybe you like to compare your, your works with other people's works so that you would feel good about yourself and be able to judge others. But that's exactly what Paul is saying doesn't work. Paul is saying that non-Jews, Gentiles, us, obtained righteousness when we didn't even pursue righteousness. If there's even a hint of you that thinks that you're more pleasing to God than an accused person or even convicted felon because of your superior lifestyle, then you're not thinking like a Christian, but like a Pharisee. That same way of thinking occurred in many of the Jews. That's, that's why many of them literally became Pharisees. Uh, look at verse 31. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. So are you acting in your practical everyday life, thinking that you're more righteous than somebody else based on what you've done? Are you acting more like a Pharisee? or like a sinner saved by grace. Jesus told this parable in Luke chapter 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me. A sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than, rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. See, God isn't looking for us to prove ourselves to him. He simply wants us to look to him for mercy. Now, I'm not saying that good works don't glorify God. They do, right? but only if they're done out of a position of faith. Um, out of a position of knowing that you're saved by the grace of God and knowing that your works don't add anything to yourself or to your salvation or to your righteousness. It's good to pursue, pursue righteousness, but not as if that can save you. Not as if that can actually make you more righteous in God's eyes, and not as if you can clean yourself up so that you'd be more acceptable to God. We pursue righteousness purely because we want to follow Jesus, the righteous one. You see, the goal of the Bible isn't that you would follow all the rules, all the rules. There's lots of commands in the Bible, right? If the, 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 the commands of the Bible, the, the point of the Bible is not that you would follow all the commands. It's that you would see and believe in the one who has followed all the rules, who we then crucified. But that's hard to accept, isn't it? We like to think that we can be good enough. That, that we can, I mean, we see these rules, we think, oh, that's just Ten Commandments. I can follow these Ten Commandments. But then we don't. We break them. We like to think that we can be good enough. We don't need to be rescued. And we certainly don't like the idea that we can be only be saved through the death of another who paid the price for us. In our pride, we think that we can fix it. We're like this. Um, imagine that you're climbing a mountain. Not like this, not climbing like this. You're walking up a mountain, all right? You're, you're climbing a mountain. You're walking up a mountain. And there's this big uh, monster named Pride that, that never stops chasing you. And it wants to eat you, okay? This, this monster named Pride wants to eat you and is chasing you. So you keep climbing the mountain to get away from that monster, but it just keeps on steadily chasing you. So you think, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll run as fast as I can up to the top of the mountain and lose that Pride monster uh, behind me. So you do. You, you sprint. You, you run super hard for a long time uh, so that you get really far ahead of it. And, and you reach the top of the mountain, and you think, man, I've made it. I'm at the top of the world. I've lost that monster. So you kick up your feet and you take a break. And that's when the pride monster catches up to you and causes you to fall. I'm sure you've heard the wisdom that, which comes straight from the Bible. Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Pride comes before a fall. The Jews thought the same way um, in terms of all this pride. End of verse 32. Uh, they stumbled over the stumbling stone 
as it is written, Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over, and the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. You, you've probably heard the phrase, don't be a stumbling stone, right? Uh, the phrase has plenty of biblical support. It's saying, don't be the one that causes others to stumble in their faith, right? Paul writes about it in other places. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, Be careful that, that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. So in other words, if you have uh, the Christian freedom to do something that isn't sin, uh, it's better to not do that thing in front of young Christians so that they don't question their faith because they think it is a sin, right? Um, probably the most clear example of this in our culture today is drinking alcohol. Uh, the Bible clearly says that getting drunk is sin. Uh, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Getting drunk is sin. But it's also clear that it's not a sin to drink in general. When, when, it, when it doesn't lead to getting drunk, um, when, uh, if it's maybe for, like Paul said to Timothy, for medicinal purposes, Jesus even turned water into wine, showing that it's okay to use to celebrate. But at, and yet there's also a lot of wisdom in thinking that thinking very carefully who you're around when you drink. And even if you drink, wine is a brawler, brawler uh, the, the proverb says, and it's wise to stay away from it completely. All I'm saying is this, even as Christians, and maybe especially as Christians, we think far too much about what's allowable for ourselves and far too little about how it will affect the faith of others. Don't be a stumbling block. We also see the same thing later in the book of Romans. Paul writes, Let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to be a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. So it's clear that we shouldn't be a stumbling block or a stumbling stone because we don't want to hinder anyone's faith. Jesus even said this in Matthew chapter 18, 6, But whoever causes one of these little ones to, who believe in me to fall away or stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That's how important it is not to be a stumbling stone to others. Clearly, we should avoid being a stumbling stone. So it's interesting that in our passage today in the book of Romans, Jesus himself is said to be the stumbling stone. Don't you find that interesting? Like, the Bible tells us over and over and over again, don't be a stumbling stone. And Jesus is the one that they will stumble over. Look at verse 33 again. Romans 9, 33. Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. And the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Paul was quoting at least a couple verses from Isaiah, mashing them together. Isaiah 28, 16 says, Therefore the Lord God said, Look, I have laid a stone in Zion, a, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will be unshakable. Which, looking at that verse alone, just that verse, it sounds pretty positive, right? Jesus would be the cornerstone, the foundation, the one that we should believe in. But then, Paul then combines this with Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, which says, He will be a, a sanctuary, but uh, for the two houses of Israel, He will be a stone to stumble over, and a rock to trip over, and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So taking these two verses, Jesus would be both the cornerstone, the cornerstone for the church, the cornerstone for our faith, the cornerstone and the stumbling stone to the Jews. It's not even so much what Jesus did, but who Jesus is. The very fact that Jesus existed causes, exists causes people to stumble. I find it extremely fascinating how so many atheists devote so much of their lives to, prove, uh, to trying to prove that Jesus wasn't the Savior. <laughs> this, I think it's kind of hilarious, actually. I was talking with somebody just la these last couple days, uh, arguing uh, these kinds of things. But, but if that's what they really thought, that if Jesus wasn't the Savior, and some, sometimes even that Jesus didn't exist, um, or th that God doesn't exist, that's what atheists believe. If, if they really thought that, they wouldn't spend any time at all talking about this. <laughs> they would think it's just pointless to talk about. You believe what you want to believe, 
and I'll believe what I want to believe, and it, none of it even matters, according to atheists. That's, that's the logic that they should have. If they really thought that there was no God and no true purpose in life whatsoever, they would simply move on and leave spirituality behind them so that they would, and, and they would just treat themselves as the master of their own lives. But the very fact that they talk about it shows that they're still in active rebellion against the God that they know that they ought to be devoted to. So don't be a stumbling stone. Instead, allow Jesus to be the stumbling stone. To be a stumbling stone for others would try to, be the, try to take the role that Jesus himself has. I think the difference is that when we cause people to stumble, they generally stumble away from faith. They see a Christian who they, they, they thought that they could respect, and they see them doing something they think is sin, and they think, oh, they, they must not take sin very seriously, and they stumble away from faith. But when Jesus causes people to stumble, the point is that they would stumble away from self-righteousness. Jesus doesn't want us... Jesus doesn't want us to get in the way of people having faith in him. He, wants, he, he himself wants to get in the way of all of us having faith in ourselves. Jesus wants us to trip up so that we would reevaluate our lives. Jesus doesn't want us to stumble in a bad way, but in a very good way. He wants us to see that the road that we often travel in life won't justify us. That we're not saved by our works, but by his grace. Because what do you do? Uh, what do you do? when you stumble. Like, if you physically stumble, uh, what do you do? I, I remember a play I was in in, um, in high school. I can't remember which play it was, but uh, as we were rehearsing the play, um, it was my job to, at, at one point, just walk across the stage. And we were rehearsing, and we were walking across the stage, and I, just, I tripped on something. So I, I just naturally looked back at it and s to see what I, I tripped on, right? And the, the director liked it so much, he said, put that in the play. <laughs> so... It was a part of the practice, the rehearsal, but he's like, put that in the play because it fit the role that I was playing. But what I, what I caught from this was that when you trip over something, when you stumble, you naturally look back and see what you stumbled over. When you stumble, when, when Jesus is to be the stumbling stone, what he wants you to do is to see him. Look at him. Recognize that you, you had a plan for your life, but he got in the way of that. <laughs> um, when, you, when you stumble... In life, turn to see Jesus on the cross. The goal is that you would fall down and worship him. And in the same way, if you're going down the wrong path, and all of us have at times, Jesus wants to interrupt your life so that you would stumble and see him and see that he's there. He's there to give you true life and true hope. A true life doesn't come through having pride in ourselves, thinking that we're strong, but recognizing that we're weak and that Jesus is our strength. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote a message that he received from God saying, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. See, that's not false humility. That's recognizing that only Jesus can save you. You see, even though we were all born ugly because of sin, God sees us as precious and beautiful because he makes us beautiful. He is the master of redemption, the God of all grace, who can turn our sin into sanctification, our guilt into glory, and our ugliness into beauty. So he speaks prophetically through, uh, of the church through Solomon, who spoke of his bride in the Song of Solomon, saying, you are absolutely beautiful, my darling. There is no imperfection in you. This is what Jesus has done for those who trust in him. Your beauty doesn't come through your striving, which just leads to more pride, which leads to a fall, but, the, but through Jesus Christ himself. So, if you have pride, stumble over Jesus. 
If you have sin, stumble over Jesus. If you have insecurities about your lack of accomplishments or your lack of righteousness or your lack of beauty, whether spiritual or physical, stumble over Jesus. See him and hear him say to you, you are absolutely beautiful. There is no imperfection in you. And believe it. You are beautiful in Christ your Savior.